Greetings, astrophiles. This is Pat Cosgrove, and I'd like to welcome you to Cosgrove's Cosmos. Today, I'll be talking about my latest imaging project, NGC 281, better known as the Pac-Man Nebula. In past segments, I've talked about the high-level image processing strategy used for an image. Since this image is very similar to my previous ones, and the image processing strategy is also similar, I'm not going to do that for this particular video. I will highlight where I change my uh, workflow a little bit for this particular project, but there's a few other topics I'd like to touch on as well. I'll also be talking about a strange imaging artifact that I got on this project that I haven't seen before. Um, I'll be talking about the use of Bill Blanchon's new SHO normalization script, which I'm using for the first time. And finally, I'll talk about trying to decide what color position I wanted for the final version of this image. Let's get started. The original data collection for the Pac-Man Nebula project took place over the evenings of October 21st and 22nd. Uh, if you've seen my previous videos, then you know that was shut down due to illness. And at the point where I stopped, I didn't feel I had enough data to process that particular image. I was kind of short on the sulfur filter data. I really wanted a chance to collect more. Weather wasn't really cooperating, but on November 23rd, I had a clear night and I had the opportunity to go out and capture another three or so hours of data, which gave me a more viable data set to work from. The final image is the result of just over eight hours of narrowband data collection. This is not the first time that I shot this particular target. My first time was back in November of 2020, and this was one of my very early mono projects. Uh, I shot it with the same telescope, but I had a different camera on it at that point. At that point, I was using an ASI 1600mm Pro camera. I did a 6.8 hour exposure, and I did some of my first uh, Hubble palette processing. And the result really didn't come out too bad. Uh, I've got pretty good detail and pretty good color, especially for that stage in my astrophotography development. This time around, I was gonna use the same telescope, but now I've upgraded the camera to an ASI 2600 mm Pro, a much more capable camera. And I was hoping to get longer integration times, but what I ended up with was just a little bit longer than what I had before. So I wanted to be able to see how these two images would compare. So I began my image processing. Well, let's jump ahead for a few moments and compare the old image with the new image. Both were taken on the same telescope. One has the advantage of having a next generation uh, ZWO uh, mono camera uh, to collect uh, the data. And uh, the only other real difference is two years of experience. Uh, between the two, I'm still pretty happy with my original effort, but I would have to say the new effort, uh, despite the dark background driven by the artifact I had to deal with, I think it has a lot more detail and a richer 3D uh, feeling to it that you don't get when you look at the first one. So I'm pretty pleased with how the two compare. Early on, I discovered something that I had not encountered before a very strange uh, image artifact was showing up in my image. It took the form of concentric rings on the lower left side of my image, along with a general strange modeling of noise across the entire image. I never encountered this kind of artifact before with this telescope or with any camera system that I've used. So I wasn't sure what caused it, but I was pretty sure it was gonna be a challenge to deal with. But I wanted to try to understand where it came from. I first noticed the problem when I was looking at the stretched color image, and it was looking like it was primarily a red problem, which uh, with the SHO mapping suggests that it was in the sulfur data. But when I looked at each master, I could see evidence of this artifact on all three, so it wasn't specific to one filter. I also looked at all of the subs, and I noticed that all of the subs had this artifact as well. Given that it was seen on all of the subs, then I have to assume this wasn't something that was an artifact of the pre-processing operation. I also looked at all of the flats and I looked at all the darks and the pattern was not to be seen in any of those. So this is something that didn't come about through a calibration process. I thought it might be possible that some 
stray light from the environment got into the, the telescope tube at some point and caused some reflections. Um, most of the leaves are off of the trees now, and there are more porch lights uh, that are reaching me that do not reach me during the year when the leaves are blocking. So I thought that might be a, a possibility. Uh, and to rule that out, I did a blink analysis of all the frames. And what I found was the, um, the pattern was in almost every frame, and it didn't vary. And if this, this was due to some local light coming in, I would have to assume that some angle would maximize the light incident in the camera t in the telescope tube. And as it tracked over several hours, it would diminish or get worse as the angles lined up. But since it's consistent for all the frames, it doesn't look like this is the result of some local light source causing some light to get into the tube at one point or another. I shared images of this artifact with some of my fellow astrophotographers, and I've shared it with the astrophotography community on Twitter, trying to see if anyone had encountered something like this before and what they thought the cause might be. So far, I haven't gotten any responses that seem to make sense with the data that I'm dealing with. So that leaves two possibilities. One possibility is that I was getting some light into the tube causing reflections, but it was consistent through my tracking, so that suggests that light source must be in the sky. And as I looked at the position of the Pac-Man Nebula, uh, just outside the field is a very bright star, which is um, Alpha Cassiopeia. That star is uh, on a vector from the center of the image to where the star is, which is lined up with where the artifact can be seen. Now, the star doesn't fit in the field of view of my camera, but maybe it's just edging in on the edge of the field of the entire uh, optical tube assembly, and maybe that's causing some, some of these reflections. I'm not sure. The other possibility might be a bit more far-fetched. I was trying to think about where I'd seen artifacts that looked like that before, and I happened to think of one, and here it is. This looks a lot like the artifact that I'm dealing with. Of course, this is the James Webb Space Telescope, and this is a strange pattern of interleaving layers of dust around a star. So apparently, uh, only that telescope and my telescope can detect these celestial features. So that's a viable option, I think, for the source of this particular artifact. Eh, maybe not. It was pretty disappointing to have this artifact in there because I knew I was going to have to deal with it. On the higher portion, higher end of the signal, for the image, I got some really nice data and a lot of good detail. But on the low end, I have this artifact I had to deal with. it. So as the image processing progressed, I tried a lot of things to try to mitigate it. And um, I did, I was able to mute it a bit, but I couldn't hide it all completely. In the end, I primarily uh, muted the effect by burying it in the blacks. Right, so if you look at this image, I think it ended up with a much darker background sky than I would prefer to do. Uh, but in this particular case, it was the best way to really hide this particular artifact. Um, in some cases, I think that's a negative for an image, but in this particular image, I also think that dark background makes the object pop a little bit more. So maybe it's not all bad. So as you're looking at this image, if you think the background's a little dark, um, and you're wondering why I did that. Well, it wasn't my first choice. It seemed to be the most expedient way to deal with this particular artifact. Um, hopefully at some time in the future when I have some free time, I'm going to come back and experiment with other ways to do that. Maybe I can pull a better final image from this data set. For this image, I use my typical workflow for uh, dealing with narrowband uh, SHO images. But I did do one change. Normally when I'm dealing with the color side of things, I take my mono images, um, I bring them into the nonlinear domain, and at that point I adjust them a bit one to another so that they look like they're better balanced. I then do a combination um, to create the first SHO image in the nonlinear space. And at that point, the images always look quite green because typically we have a strong H alpha signal and that's being mapped to the green channel and that causes a green uh, balance. So now there's a series of operations to color balance to get the traditional Hubble look um, and that's where things end up. But Bill Blanchin, who has been um, releasing a series of very elegant and very powerful uh, scripts 
for processing images has just come out with a new SHO normalizing script. I really wanted to try that out. Now, the way Bill has this set up, it works a little bit differently than my normal flow. In his flow, you would take the mono images in the linear space, do a channel combination to create your first SHO image. At that point, you go starless. So now we have a starless SHO color image in the linear domain. You apply his script and that does the normalization and produces something much more typical of what you would expect from a Hubble palette. Uh, so I tried that out and uh, I got actually very good results. And uh, also another feature I think of most of Bill's scripts is that there's the ability to change how it operates by adjusting some parameters. In this particular script, um, he has a symbol table where you can change parameters. And I was able to do that a bit and customize the output I got to something I liked a little bit better. I thought the script worked uh, very intuitively. Um, it worked well. I liked the result. The only downside is because I had this imaging artifact for this particular image, uh, the result highlighted that. Now, that's not the fault of the script. That's the fault of the data. And it was just something I was going to have to deal with. But I found that uh, Bill's script got me to uh, a color position I like much qu more quickly and easily. And um, I like the fact that it had quite a bit of control on how it did that. So I anticipate using this much more uh, commonly as we move forward. To give you a better feel for how this worked, here is the initial SHO linear image that I created. I then took that image starless by using star exterminator. At that point, I applied the script, I applied uh, Bill script with the parameters adjusted to look like this. And here is the result of that particular image. At this point, all I had to do is translate this into the nonlinear domain. Then I continued my normal color processing by applying a series of color masks to allow me to adjust the color to get it exactly where I wanted it. Uh, I, I was very happy with the use of the tool, and uh, I'd like to thank Bill for adding yet another valuable resource to the astrophotography community. My final topic for today is determining the final color position for this particular image. For those who have watched my previous videos or have seen my work on my website, then you probably know that I'm known as a high color guy and that I like my images to have considerable color saturation and contrast, uh, maybe more than a, what a lot of the astrophotography community would prefer. I blame this on my career in the Eastman Kodak Company, where I spent many years uh, driving the enhancement of consumer images. And what we found there is consumers have a very strong appetite for high color saturation. Uh, creating images that are more pleasing than the original scenes, uh, more pleasing than reality, is something that seems to work. And I spent a lot of years developing methods that would do that for consumer images. And so now that I'm doing astrophotography, some of that carries through. And I know I have a tendency sometimes to go too far. And in this particular image, I had a pretty strong color position for the final nebula, but that nebula was sitting on a background sky that was much darker than I normally have. And so the contrast there seemed to pop and be even more aggressive. Uh, based on that, I knew I might be getting out too far. And what I often do when I'm getting that feeling is I'll create a second version of the image that has a lower color saturation. So that's what I did here. Here's my original image. And here is the second image that I created that has a slightly lower saturation and slightly lower contrast. I take these two as, uh, as a comparison test and I share them. Uh, and then I look for feedback. Uh, I share them in two particular uh, places. First, I have a couple of local astrophotography friends that uh, I, I interact with quite a bit. Um, they're very experienced, been doing this a long time, and I have a huge respect uh, for their feedback. And so I shared the images with them and asked for them to weigh in on them. The second thing that I did is I shared, um, the, shared both images with the astrophotography Twitter community. Uh, that Twitter community can be quite proactive uh, and often has a really interesting perspective. So I posted um, the following tweet and asked for feedback. And I ended up getting uh, quite a few back. 
tallying up everything, what I found was um, there was a strong preference for the lower color position, uh, almost two to one. I mean, it's a very strong signal and one that I wanted to, to really look at. Um, one of the things that seems to happen is that some people don't like the high saturated blues. I tend to like those. And so sometimes I go too far. The second point that was shared by several people, and I think it's a valid point, is that when the saturation is a little bit less intense, it helps some of the dark nebulae to pop a little bit more. And I think that's a valid point of view. So based on that, I went back and finalized the processing on my image and uh, ending up with this final image here. It's a little bit lower in color, especially on the blue areas, but I still find the image quite pleasing. I'm happy with it. And um, the nice thing about having your own web page is I can show both versions of the image. Uh, I may lead with one, but uh, I can still get the one that I developed in there um, and show it for those people who do like the high color position. Uh, I did find I'm not the only person in the astrophotography community who likes high color. There is quite a few people on Twitter who also liked the higher color position. Just a lot more did not. <laughs> so it's good to have that input. You should always create images that feel right for you. Um, you know, it's your expression as an artist, I guess. Um, these are the images that you produce the way you produce them. But it's also wise to make sure that you're grounded and you're doing something that a broader audience would like as well. Now that you've seen both images, which one do you like better? I'd like to hear from you. I hope you found this short video overview of the NGC 281 Imaging Project helpful and I thank you for watching. As always, I welcome your questions and comments both on this channel and on the website. Please stay tuned for more imaging projects. I have data for at least one more um, that I'll be publishing in the weeks ahead. Uh, and it may be the last of the year. At this time of the year, the clouds tend to close in and stay until March. And my data gathering uh, shuts down for that period of time. But then I use that period of time to start pulling together more technical articles. And I'll try to do some technical videos as well. Please consider subscribing and ringing the bell, and that way you won't miss any content as it's published. Signing off, this is Pat Cosgrove from Cosgrove's Cosmos, and I wish you clear skies and excellent seeing.